The banks are not okay. I'm Mike Wilkerson, and this is the Stormwall Advisors monthly update for January 2024. Happy New Year, everyone. Hope it's going to be a, a great year. Uh, coming back to you now on, you, on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're seeing this, please give it a like, share, and subscribe, and turn on the notifications bell. You can also find me on Twitter at MW underscore Stormwall. And why don't we jump right into it? I want to talk about uh, the state of the banks, as uh, uh, as my opener implied. And I'm going to see if we can't share a screen here. So let me move this on over and jump right into it. Okay, so um, I wrote an article uh, towards the end of the month of December called The Banks Are Not Okay. And this was uh, first published in the Epic Times and then picked up by Zero Hedge. And I was hitting on a number of issues that uh, I think are, are still quite important. You know, it's been very quiet on the banking front since we had the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank uh, in March of 2023 and the other events of that of that month. First Republic going down, Credit Suisse going down in Europe, one of the largest and most uh, important uh, systemic banks in that region being forced to merge uh, into, into UBS. And, um, and then after a couple other smaller bank signature and otherwise, things got pretty quiet and they have been quiet really over the second half of the year, while the stock market, financial markets generally, all asset classes have been on a pretty strong rise, whatever issues are going on in the bank seem to be largely being ignored. So I want to dive into that a little bit. If you go back to what happened with Silicon Valley Bank's collapse, this led to or was concurrent with a massive deposit flight out of the banks as investors move money out of uh, out of banks into money market funds where they were making a bit more money on interest where banks continue to pay uh say 1% interest on deposits where with treasuries rising fed funds rates rising to 5% investors depositors were able to get a much better yield and there was this perception of risk in the banks that perhaps things weren't weren't safe and weren't okay so we see over a trillion dollars of deposits had left the U.S. banking system by April of 2023 uh, at the same time Silicon Valley Bank occurred. Now, at that time, the Federal Reserve put in some emergency funding plans in order to uh, you know, protect and, and, and shore up the banking system. And it's a good thing they did, because if you look at what happened at the time, uh, the banks borrowed over $325 billion by the end of April after basically nothing. And you can take this chart all the way back and you wouldn't see anything even going back as far as the global financial crisis that compares to it. Um, so you look at, uh, let me go get this to move here. Hang on. Uh, what's happened since, these deposits have not come back into the banking system. Yes, deposit flight has slowed. So here we are with the crisis, Silicon Valley Bank in the first quarter of 2023. Certainly after that, deposit flight slowed, but it's still tracking at about 100 billion dollars a quarter that's a problem for uh for the banks and for the banking system so in the meantime the banks are borrowing heavily from the various government agencies so the federal home loan banks are in turn uh, uh, uh issuing bonds into the market over uh, 1.1 trillion uh, in 2023 uh, as they raise money to be able to fund back to back the the banks that they support and represent and you can see here just in the month of of october 100 million of bond issuance uh significantly outpacing any uh, of the last uh, of the last five years and at the same time we're still seeing even here to the end of december the bank use of this emergency line called the bank term funding program remains at an all-time high in fact it hit its highest peak uh, at the end of the month. Here you see it back in uh, in March and, and April when it first was being put into place. So the banks are remaining heavily dependent on the Federal Reserve, on these government programs, government funding programs, in order to fund uh, their assets, in order to have li liabilities to match. And uh, this is also you know, causing a similar problem, or related to a similar problem that Silicon Valley Bank had, which really led to its collapse, which was uh, massive unrealized losses that uh, are, have resulted from the rising interest rate environment. And we see that over, uh, and this isn't going away. So we see in the third quarter, the problem's actually getting worse with unrealized losses up 
uh, over 22% to $684 billion uh, just in the uh, securities portfolio for these banks. And if you look at it, uh, about 300 million of this is on available for sale assets, as opposed to held to maturity where the banks are specifically saying, no, no, we're going to keep this loan until it matures and we will get our money back, even though today it may be uh, sitting, we may, we may be facing a loss that we're not going to realize, but as long as we hold it to its due date, we believe we're going to get repaid and be made whole. Well, the problem here is that of that, nearly 300 billion of available for sale securities if interest rates remain higher for longer going into 2024 a portion of these afs low losses are going to begin to realize in 2024 as they're sold by the banks that is going to put additional pressure on bank profitability and on their capital levels so um as, as mentioned we saw that we saw the, the oops i'm going the wrong way here let me try to go back uh so the other thing that Zero Hedge pointed out as a comment to my article, which I hadn't focused on, was that these funding programs, which were authorized a year ago in March 2023, at the time were based on unusual and exigent circumstances within the banking sector, i.e. the massive deposit runs that we've talked about. That authorization, funding authorization, is set to expire in March of 2024. The question is, then what happens? You know, either these programs need to be renewed, which means the Fed needs to establish that we're still in a crisis. We still have unusual and exigent circumstances in the banking sector, not a message that they want to send out, put out to the markets. On the other hand, where does the bank funding come from if the banks are no longer able to borrow from the Fed and from these other sources? This is a significant question that we're going to find the answer to in a couple of months. Um, but it is a concern. Now, in anticipation of some of this uh, happening, what we see is that the banks themselves are restructuring. So we've seen more uh, than 60, I guess, roughly 62,000 banking related jobs that were lost in 2023. That compares to about 140,000 in the global financial crisis. So not quite at those levels yet. But we're really seeing most of this is coming from the money center banks, the Wall Street investment banks. And by the way, about 20% of it were job losses, mostly from Credit Suisse as a result of Credit Suisse's failure and absorption by UBS. Now, this isn't over. It's like we're likely to see more restructuring, more job losses in 2024. But this isn't going to solve the problem for the banks. Compensation is not as significant a, a, a proportion as what the banks are exposed to from a credit uh, perspective and a loss losses on investment securities and other things. So it, it's a necessary but not sufficient step to try to address some of these issues. So I want to wrap it up. Key takeaways, the banks are not okay. We still have significant risk going into 2024 of another round of bank failures. That is because we still are sitting on heavy levels of unrealized losses. Profit and capital levels will be under pressure in 2024. And as long as interest rates remain high, banks aren't going to be able to make money in the medium term until they're, they roll off some of those older legacy assets that are uh, accruing very, very low numbers of, of interest and yield. Right now, the banks are needing to find a way to replace deposits lost. They're going to have to offer market-related rates of interest, real uh, interest, meaning after the effect of inflation. And if inflation is still running at 3 to 4%, which is almost certainly the case in, in actual terms, that implies the banks have to offer 4 to 5% interest. That's going to be very hard to do to pay that uh, out while they're sitting on these legacy assets that are yielding 2 3%. Uh, percent. So, um, and by the way, if we do get a U.S. fiscal crisis as a result of the mountain of national debt, the rising uh, def continued deficits, rising debt, over a trillion dollars of interest service costs being paid out every year, any U.S. fiscal crisis would immediately bleed over into the entire banking sector, uh, and we would see something that was that was a systemic issue right away. That is that would be a near catastrophic risk, and I don't believe it's a zero probability. I think this is something we've talked about the U.S. fiscal crisis, the the uh, what I've called the deficit debt inflation doom loop. We are still spiraling in that, and unless that is arrested, we are headed towards a crisis. We are headed towards a wall. It's a question of when, not whether. 
So with that, why don't we wrap it up? Thank you for your time. I will close out this uh, screen share, come back to you and say thank you for, uh, for listening, for watching. You can always get a copy of this presentation and others reach out to us at hello at stormwelladvisors.com. Again, remember, please give it a like, a share, uh, subscribe to my channel on YouTube, subscribe uh, to my account on Twitter, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Stormwell Advisors Monthly Up Update.